Um, we are going to continue with our program, and I have to say that I am uh, very, very, very excited for this next segment, which features real-life patients. So we are going to hear from five patients um, about, you know, what it's like living with NMOSD and MOGAD. And this session is going to be uh, moderated by Rebecca Whitney at SRNA, and it will feature... Avery, Liz, Kim, Barbara, and Rebecca. So please join me in welcoming Rebecca. Well, if I can have the panelists come up and, and join me up here, that'd be wonderful. So. And I think this is always one of the greatest parts of being able to do this, right? To have everybody come and share their, their very personal and impactful stories. So, um, okay. Well, I think we'll just get started very simply. If we just want to go down the row here, we'll start with Avery. And if you can just tell us your name. Your, your diagnosis and perhaps when you were able to arrive at that diagnosis. Yeah, absolutely, so my name is Avery Allman. I am 25 years old and I was diagnosed with MOGAD at age 19. I was um, a track runner in college and then all of a sudden I lost my vision and within about a week and a half I was a paraplegic on my way to being fully paralyzed. So I was fortunate enough to get my diagnosis about two months after when the MOGAD test came out. So that's me. Barbara Nichols, and um, I'm not going to give my age. <laughs> you don't do that. You can do that when you're your age. Um, and I was had my first attack um, of NMO in 2002, um, where I lost the vision in my left eye, and then in 2007 is when I had the spinal cord attack. Um, so it took a while to be diagnosed. It was not until uh, later that year in 2007 that I was diagnosed. So it's first thought to be MS, as many of us are. And um, then they decided I was just unlucky. So <laughs> that was comforting. <laughs> um, so it took a little bit to get it, but uh, fortunately I was able to, to get that done. I'm, <clears throat> I'm Kim Kukuro. Um, I had my first event. 2009, 38 years old, um, and it took about almost a year to get properly diagnosed. I had symptoms on and off for about nine months, and then um, was paralyzed from my rib cage down, and diagnosed with MS in the hospital and transverse myelitis. And then got to Dr. Greenberg, who took a look at my scans and and said, I think you have NMO. And so I didn't originally test positive for an NMO, but I did later on. I had a second event uh, after my father died with my eyes, um, was able to had eye pain and some blurry vision and was able to come back from that much quicker because I was already diagnosed. And I've been, I've not had an event in 10 years. Um, I'm Elizabeth Bramer, for those who don't know me, otherwise known as Lizard, thanks to Samira. Um, <laughs> I had my very first attacks when I was very young. Um, it was back in 1993, and I was 11 years old when I first lost my vision um, to optic neuritis and had three attacks back to back. Um, I was pulled out of school, homeschooled, or, you know, and they just tried to figure out what was wrong with me, and they told me it was maybe pre MS because I didn't fit any area. Um, it was not until 2001 that I had a major episode, and at that time they diagnosed me with MS. And of course, the MS medications, you know, are just exacerbate things. Um, but we kind of managed to get my health other, under control so I could graduate from college and law school. And then right after law school in 2007, um, I was hit hard and fast with another major optic neuritis episode in my remaining good eye. Um, and at that time is when I was diagnosed with an MO. Um, and so actually that was my, my title. NMO patient for many years, 
And it was not until 2020 that I tested for MOG. And bam, now I'm a MOGI. So, um, so we went from being NMO for 13 years to a MOG patient now. So, yeah. Hi, I'm Rebecca Aursler. And um, in 2006, I started having vision problems in my left eye. I noticed when I was putting on my makeup that I wasn't able to see where I was placing my eyeliner. And then I got pregnant with our third child and all my symptoms went away and was fine until after she was born and then had an episode then of what I thought was just back pain. I had gone to my uh, spinal doctor and they said, yep, you have L4 and L5 vertebrae, you need to go get a um, steroid injection. And as they were about to wheel me in, for my steroid injection, my doctor actually stopped me and he said, I think you have MS. He had looked at my MRIs. And so um, from there, went to a neurologist and then got on um, Rebif and went kind of downhill. And, and then, as we all have said, and then Greenberg. <laughs> and so you go to Greenberg and... Um, but finding the right doctor and finding the right treatment. And I've been um, symptom free since for 10 years now. Well, thank each of you for, for being here and for being open and vulnerable <coughs> with um, something that's very personal, right? It becomes a, a significant part of our identities when we're, we're facing things like this. Um, and especially when we start off thinking one thing, oh, it's possibly MS. No, no, it's not that. It's going to be this. And I think it was alluded to earlier, you know, these, these names we come up with <laughs> for these disorders are quite a mouthful. And the symptoms range and they change, right? It's not always static. So how do you, how do you describe to someone who's never heard of these disorders what it is that you're facing on a daily basis? Does anyone want to start off? I kind of like to use like analogies that are a bit extreme, like saying that my spine feels like it's being set on fire and my eyes are being ripped out of my head because I feel like sometimes that's the only way to really convey the severe amounts of pain we go through. With having you know an, a, an invisible disorder and have it being rare at that, you're already not believed and that can already pose a problem. So I, I, try, I try to use analogies that people can kind of cling to and understand a little bit. Anyone else? Kim? <laughs> you are making not cut time. So. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to look this way from now on. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I guess for me, um, one thing that I do try to do is um, when they were talking about educating your doctors, um, find good sources on the, the internet. And like when I go into a doctor, I have... I have something, you know, printed off that tells what I, what it is, the symptoms I have, things that can make it worse, things that can make it better, um, and just use that as an example when I go into my doctors. Um, personally, it's hard to tell someone what because it is you say autoimmune or anything like that, and you know they don't quite understand. Um, a lot of times, I'll just say it's like a spinal cord injury. It's like if a football player got got hurt or car accident and your spine's damaged. I have that damage, it just came about from a different way. Um, I think another thing that I sometimes use is I'm a professional patient. I, it's hours and hours and hours of my life spending, you know, that I spend talking to, you know, doctors, other caregivers, things like that. And I think that's something else too that um, it's an, it is another facet of who we are, is we are professional patients because we spend a lot, an enormous amount of time on um, trying to work with everybody, and that takes a lot of coordination, and it usually starts with us. It starts from the bottom up. So. All right. Thank you very much. And I think it's safe to say that yeah. these diagnoses impact every aspect of life, right? It's not just going to possibly keep you out of work for a little bit. It's, it's going to impact how you, how you parent, how you uh, move through, through education and school. Um, is there any particular 
role that you maybe each identify with where you felt the most significant impact of having a MOG or an MO diagnosis? When I was first, um, when I first met Dr. Greenberg, he, I had gone through this time of being in the hospital and paralyzed on IVIG treatment for a week. Um, and what he said to me, and this is the role that it, that it was, is that I had this 18-month-old daughter, and he said, I want to be able to get you on the floor to play with your daughter and be able to pick her back up again. And as a mom, that spoke to me because he saw me as a mom and not as a, necessarily just as a patient. Like, he saw the whole me. And so the role that had the most significant impact from the disease has been the mom role. But it has also allowed me to show my kids what resiliency looks like and what hopefulness looks like and what faith looks like. And so I can't begrudge the disease because I think it's taught me and my family so much as a result. I think for me, since I was in college and I was a track runner, it was kind of unfathomable for people to believe I was in the condition that I was. And with being an athlete, you're always kind of expected to bounce right back from injuries and to kind of have that don't tell anyone about your pain unless like mm -hmm. you're dying kind of situation. Mm -hmm. And I remember many therapists and doctors and nurses would walk into the room. This is me fresh off paralysis. And they'd be like, oh, are you running yet? And I think it took the one doctor to ask, okay, how are we gonna get you to run? That I think really made a difference for me and it kind of made me not feel forced, like I had to quickly recover from you know, such an attack. And I think adding more of that into our healthcare and having doctors use language that is more fitting for the patient and not kind of, not bringing them down in a sense, but not making them feel like they have to be at a certain point after their attack. Thank you very much. How about you, Barbara? As far as what role, I think at the time, uh, the eye thing that was just, you know, driving again was exciting. <laughs> Um, getting that person to get in the car with you. <laughs> My husband was very brave. So um, it was kind of learning those things since I was working at that time. And so making those kind of adjustments. And then but the big one was the spinal cord attack. I was pretty much paralyzed from mid chest down. And um, it took a while to get going from that. I finally got to where I could work. That's, I got up to seven hours a day. I just couldn't make that last one <laughs> for about three years. Um, so that was very impactful because I had a very busy and big workload and big job. So that was um, the challenging part, mm -hmm. I think. And then the other thing is just, you know, dealing with other people kind of telling you, well, you look fine. <laughs> I always wanted, muttered under my breath, well, be glad you're not on this side. <laughs> but um, so that's kind of interesting, too. Well, thank you. And as far as, you know, you go through the different acute attacks, right, the, the relapses or exacerbations, and, you know, your, your different family and social supports are probably cognizant of you having a, a rare disorder or you're in the hospital again and then you go back and, and you look fine, right? Mm -hmm. um, how, do you, how do you go about um, finding those resources and supports to get you back to, to living your daily life, to continuing through and managing those symptoms so that you're not back in the hospital and um, you're able to to go back to work and and do those things. How do you how do you connect with with others who will have that understanding that it's this is a lifelong issue, not just a one time hospitalization kind of issue? Well, I think we can all agree therapy and self care are super important and kind of the basis of what allows all of us to kind of overcome the psychological battle of some of that. 
And once we do that, then we're able to kind of reach out and branch out and meet with others and and work on, you know, building a collaborative support system. But it has to start with us first because if we're not in the right headspace, you know, we have to make sure that we take care of ourselves before we are able to really sometimes connect. But at the same time, it's a double-edged sword. That connection also can help boost our self-care. So does that make sense? I think somebody said earlier, it's all about the company you keep. And I truly believe that when you have a diagnosis like this, it weeds out the people that are not supposed to be around you. I had people that I considered, (laughs) (laughs) I had people that I considered best friends, like girls that have, you know, spent holidays with me and people that I was with all the time and I was very close to their family, didn't visit me in the hospital because I was being dramatic Avery. And I think you have to have people that understand chronic. We understand you get sick and you get better or you get sick and you don't get better. It's that middle portion where I think we need to put more emphasis on what is a chronic illness, the ups and downs of a chronic illness. And so if people don't understand that, they're not meant to be in your life. And I think especially for the younger people with the disease, you just really have to be mindful of who's your friend, who are you surrounding yourself with, who's going to support you. Nobody should make you feel like you aren't telling the truth. Nobody should make you feel like you're not significant in what you're going through. So I just really narrows it down to it's all about the company you keep. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Thank you. Go ahead, Barbara. I was very fortunate, and my husband was super supportive. He learned how to do laundry and cook and (laughs) all those things that were so helpful. He really jumped in there, and and that makes a huge difference to have that support system. My family was also very supportive. Um, I'm the youngest, so having two older brothers, you know, they were very protective. (laughs) So, um, and then, you know, my work. Um, friends, because that's where you spend so much time when you're working full time, were very good, and and that makes a huge difference to have people around you that understand. And you know, I had bosses that would, okay, it's time for you to go home, and I was like, oh no, I'll be fine. You know, you try to just suck it up and keep going, and, and it's like, no, I can tell by your eyes, it's time for you to go. And so having that kind of support system makes a huge difference. And there's, you can tell, you know, certain friends can handle it and others um, can't maybe. And then the ones that can handle it, it's so good to have that. And then the other thing was just meeting other people um, with that same diagnosis. And that makes a huge difference and that's something I would encourage people to do. Um, I got involved with SRNA and the support group and uh, we had a group meeting and so that was very helpful to have others that um, know your situation and understand. So if you can have that kind of support group, then that's available to you, then by all means participate. And Barbara's a very special person to me because she was the first person that I ever got to meet in person with an NMO diagnosis. And so that was really special and that was a long time ago now. (laughs) But yeah, I mean, I feel like, you know, meeting those people, making those connections, it's like, bam, you all of a sudden have another ally again, and that's huge. Yes, yes, Barbara, you you have been such an incredible person for our community. Barbara was longtime support group leader for SRNA in the Dallas area, and I know that I've been able to connect different individuals from our community to you who were feeling so lost and so alone, and you've been able to to help talk them through a diagnosis and even for their loved ones. So thank you so much for for being open and, and being accessible in that way. So it does make a difference, right, to be able to connect with others who, who understand even without having to say so many words, right? So... I I guess a question I would have, too, is if you could go back to before the diagnosis, before those initial attacks, is there anything that you would say to yourself to prepare or to say what it's going to look like? I know, you know, you mentioned that you were 11 when you first had an attack. You know, what would you tell your 11-year-old self? 
if you could go back and talk to her about what life is like now? Well, it's, it's kind of interesting because I've had a lot, a lot of retrospection time to think about that recently because my own kids are now the age that I was when I was first going through this. So this time frame is very bittersweet to me with my own children. Mm-hmm. Um, and if I, if I had to go back, I would probably tell myself to give myself some grace. Um, don't be so hard on yourself and um, don't second guess yourself. And I was very, very fortunate that my parents believed me. They didn't think that I was trying to make anything up. Um, They knew that I was telling the truth. You know, even when the psychiatrist is coming in to talk to me, it's like, you know, I would just, I would just look back and encourage and say, you got this, you know, and give yourself some grace. Um, Don't be so hard on yourself, especially when you don't have the same physical capability you did even just a week ago. Give yourself some grace. Yeah. I think I'd tell myself to buckle up because <laughs> <laughs> I think we can all agree it's a ride with a lot, a lot of negatives, but there's also so many positives to it. I've met some of my best friends um, with this disease, and I have found my purpose in life. I know that advocacy and working in rare disease is something now I, I want to do. And I think you have to t- kind of take everything with a grain of salt and one, one step at a time, not in the literal sense if you can't, but I think it's, I think it's important to also have that self-compassion. I think for me it would be to educate yourself, which now we have so many options. Mm-hmm. When I was diagnosed, you know, the Internet had information that it was 10 years old and when I was in the hospital, they were Googling it. They had never heard of transverse myelitis even. Um, and just use that and find the best doctors you can and the best staff. And I'm a Greenberg fan just like <laughs> everyone here. And walking into his office after I'd had several doctors that were not good doctors, my original doctor, when I told him I was paralyzed from the rib cage down, he said, I don't think it's a neurological problem. And I ignored that, I listened to my body, and I went to the ER immediately. And and so finding Dr. Greenberg who said, yes, this is part of you, it's not who you are, mm-hmm. it's a part of you, you can have kids, you mm-hmm. can have a life, you can work, you can, he made that um, give me hope. I needed that hope at that time. Mm-hmm. And so just find the best doctor you can, educate yourself, um, and find the, uh, Maybe not be the best, but the best for you, mm-hmm. and um, and follow that, and and know when you got you have even good doctors and others, not just your neurologist, but someone that understands and will listen to you what you have. Thank you, and Rebecca. I was just going to say, let people help, um, because you can be you can turn into yourself and try to keep your diagnosis either a secret because you don't want people to worry about you or you don't want to um, humble yourself and ask for help, but people want to help you and they want to show their love for you. And so going back to younger Rebecca would have been, just let them do it. (laughs) Just let them come over and fold your laundry for you because that makes them feel better, but it shows them how much they love you too. Stop being so stubborn. Yes. yes. I think that's important for people that have caregivers, too, is to, if you're a caregiver, that's what they're there for. You shouldn't have to feel any kind of way for asking for help or accepting it. Great. I had always been the one trying to take care of everybody else. So it was really strange to be on the other end and tried to kind of resist that. And so I would reiterate what you said about letting people help. I had a friend that set me down and said, you're denying me a blessing from God. Right. <laughs> I, I want to help Aww. you, and you're denying me that blessing. It's like, well, just that. tear out the knife. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but it's really true as to, um, you know, people don't know what to say or they don't know how to help, so let them help you, and mm-hmm. you don't have to do it all on your own. Thank you. And how, how, do, you, how do you take care of yourselves? whether it's, you know, exercise and staying, you know, physically in shape or, you know, making sure that your mental health and your emotional well-being is is where it should be to 
keep yourselves the best, the best you as possible. And how does that help you hold on to hope? Rebecca, I'm going to start with you. Okay. Um, how do I take care of myself? So I am um, very involved in my church, and my passion is for special needs ministry. And so being able to um, continue to do that, um, where not that's where I find my identity, but that's where I find purpose and where I feel like I'm I'm helpful to others. And so caring for others helps me in turn care for myself um, because it doesn't keep me away from something I have a passion for. Allowing myself space to go and, and do for others has helped me become better and helped me become healthier. When I would turn away from anyone and keep to myself if I was feeling sick or down, that's when I was the least caring for myself is when I was selfishly turning into myself. And by focusing out on others, it made me better. Um, I completely agree with that. Uh, I think that that's actually, I mean, I graduated from law school in 2007. I didn't take the bar exam until 2020, and passed in the middle of COVID, so 13 years later. But Congratulations. That, thank you. But taking that, um, like she said, you know, you, you kind of start to go inward. And again, it's for me to help other people. And it, it really puts things in perspective for you. You're like, you know what? I'm still one of the lucky ones. Right. You know? Um, and you have to find those silver linings. It, the detail really is in the little things. Like, the, the, you know, you find those sweet spots and you savor them. Um, and don't let those go. So that way when you're in the dumps, you remember, you know what? For every low, there's a high too. Um, and, but yeah, I think turning outwards to help others and, you know, finding others so that way you can make sure that, that, um, they're not going through the same thing that you did with zero information. Paying it forward, it, I feel like is huge, um, in any way that you can. One thing that I tried in the beginning when, before I was uh, more comfortable with speaking to people was is so cheesy, but I would make video diaries of myself just to get it out. You know, you as a patient, we, there's so much, not only physically, but mentally. There's comments from people that we hear. You don't have to watch the video. You don't have to play it for people, but simply taking the time to get that out of you and making sure it's something you're not bearing, it can kind of really help you sort through those difficult emotions. And having a conversation with yourself can be really difficult but once you're able to do that, it's so much easier to open yourself up to other people and other people going through the same thing, especially. I love that, mm -hmm. the self-reflection and yeah. getting some of those, those bad thoughts, voices, whatever, out mm -hmm. so you can wrangle them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, how about you, Kim? Uh, for me, for self-care, um, I really changed um, my eating, my exercise. Exercise for me was huge. I had a lot of tactile pain, spasticity, um, and so, and when I was first diagnosed, I mean, a walk to the mailbox was a big accomplishment, so, it, but just, I've realized that just moving, doing something every day, whether it's 10 minutes, five minutes, you know, um, make it easy, make it fun. I keep tennis shoes at my desk at work and take a 10-minute walk or up the stairs. My spin bike is in my living room in front of my TV, you know, next to my couch, to the horror of my mother who's watching this right now. Um, but just, you know, if I have to walk by the bike, it, it makes a difference, and just mentally and physically. Um, so for me, I, I move better, and, and I have less symptoms than I did if I'm exercising as much as I can. Barbara, anything in particular that you just I think you know doing the support group thing um, and educating myself about it but to um, be able to help other people was very therapeutic for me as well but um, you know as you get to talk to people and that some you just really connect with and uh, having that person that's got a common situation you know is really um, really helpful 
and I, I it just I was involved with talking with other people and heard a lot of different stories and um, I, it made me very grateful because I you know came back from from that and didn't have it near as bad as some people have to deal with and so anytime I think that we can be grateful for you know what God's given us is very healing and good mm-hmm. well I I have to say I'm I'm incredibly overwhelmed by by the hope that each of you express in and how you how you come to it right in in connecting with other people and I think that's you know so much of what the Sumaira Foundation is about what SRNA is about is connecting all of the individuals together so that you don't feel alone because we do need that support we do need to work together so uh, I really I'm, I'm really overwhelmed by your <laughs> responses I will be entirely honest but um, another question would be if if someone who was newly diagnosed today if you had to go into their hospital room and speak to them and it's a it's a young woman or a, a young child or a new mother what is one thing that you would want them to know about what it means to live with an NMO or a MOG diagnosis that you can do it mm-hmm. you know uh, we refer to it as the new normal <laughs> and um, that there's a lot of hope when I was first diagnosed um, there wasn't much available information in 2007 and so when I got home from the hospital I saw where my poor husband had read all this stuff on the internet and it was awful I was like well no wonder he looked so worried <laughs> me I didn't have access to any access to anything so I didn't really know what was going on so um, you know stay off the internet back then especially I mean, it's better now but <laughs> first thing is stay off the internet um, but to have a good care team that that you can can work with that's so much that was said today with once I got to Dr. Greenberg too it's like okay this is going to be fine well one of the things that I um and somebody in the audience can attest to this because I just met her a few months ago um but it's like hey this is a journey this is just stop number one this is a speed bump in the road you have a long, long way to go. And starting now, you automatically have a leg up with the medical medical community and the patient community that's already here for you. We're already here for you and we're cheering you along this path on your journey now. You're not alone, you know? I think if you're gonna be a part of any rare disease community, this is the one to be a part of. The, yes. Not just, not just for the foundations, but for the organizations that help outside of that, for the pharmaceutical companies. Everybody is so open and truly just genuinely like a good person. You know, there's a lot of not good people in the world, and I haven't really stumbled across many people in this community that aren't after the same thing of making everybody feel like they can do something and achieve something after, after their diagnosis. I think I would tell people, take it one day at a time. It, I would get up in the morning, I'd say, okay, this is what I need to do today. And then if I look too far out, you know, three months, because, you know, I was told in six months, if you don't have your filling back and you, you know, then you won't, you won't ever get it, which was not true. I got, I got better three years. I'm, you know, you still can get better. Um, but yeah, just uh, to know that take it one day at a time or else it does get overwhelming the doctor's appointments the therapy and everything but if you just get through that one day and and get through the next and then before you know it you're walking again you're feeling better you're getting back out in the world do you have anything else to yes to this <laughs> <laughs> all right and uh, you know you've all you know talked about um, you know finding the right the right physician and being able to talk and dr. Greenberg thank you for being such a significant source of hope and support for our community you have some big fans here obviously Um, but for for the other clinicians and even you know we have industry 
um, in the room as well. Mm -hmm. What is one thing that you want them to know about interacting with patients who are facing a rare diagnosis um, as far as your, your hopes for what they might, might learn or how they would share or interact with, with their patients or how they continue to um, evolve research? One of the things that I noticed earlier was, and I think that Dr. Greenberg and Christine hit the nail on the head, doctors listen. <laughs> just, just hear us out. Um, we like to be treated like the entire human being that we are, not just our diagnosis. Um, and again, everybody has a different experience and the medicine is still evolving. And so, again, a good bedside manner goes a long way. And that's one of the reasons that Dr. Greenberg is so valuable to everybody, because he really does take the time and listen to the individual, not just patient X that has XYZ diagnosis. And that is that is everything, because sometimes all we want is to be heard. I think doctors um, should work on learning to empathize with patients a little bit more. Um, I remember one doctor that significantly changed the course of of my health said um, to me, I'm going to talk to you as if you're my child. And it was that conversation that really changed my whole path of things. And I really felt like I was heard. I didn't feel like what I was saying was being invalidated or anything. So sympathy goes a long way. And just, it, I know it's it's kind of hard, but put yourself in that position. Like if you were your own child or if you were me, how would you feel in that situation? If if this, if you say something into yourself, you say, mm, I don't know if I would like to hear that. You probably shouldn't say it. That makes sense. Yes, it absolutely does. <laughs> I'll sing Paula's praises too, because she's fantastic and. <laughs> Um, she, she knows me as a person. She knows my kids' names. She knows what I'm doing in life. And when I come in and in those appointments, um, I'm kind of looking forward to catching up with her and learning about what's going on with her. And she's me. And it's almost like a coffee shop conversation to begin with. And that calms you down and settles you for then talking about the medical piece of of who you are but um, having that friendship that is formed over 13 years is um, so important because then you trust more and you I feel like the listening is a two-way street between us definitely thank you and I think we're, we're coming close to the end of this session. So um, if there are any questions from the audience, I can't, I can't see. <laughs> Hello, can you guys hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, any tips, advice on dating, relationships, and marriage with NMO and MOGAD? Take me or leave me, baby. <laughs> Dating is, is hard what in it general. Is. <laughs> Dating is really hard in general, but when you tell somebody, oh, sometimes I accidentally defecate on myself because I have bowel and bladder issues, that's not really the most attractive thing to hear. So I would love to hear your guys' <laughs> tips and tricks because I'm still trying to figure it out myself. I don't know what his judgment was. I just found him, you know, it's fine. You got the lottery on that. <laughs> but Barbara, you've been married for a long time, so. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, almost 49 years so um, oh, yes. yeah <laughs> it's getting serious <laughs> <laughs> so like I said he's been great through it all he definitely didn't know what he was signing up for <laughs> but um, uh, that that's important and I don't have any advice for you to dating I barely remember that so <laughs> Well, I'll just say that literally it, it is the ultimate test of a relationship. It really is. Um, and uh, I know a lot of people that have had spouses leave because of their diagnosis. But at the same time, you meet some amazing people along the way and 
you know, like I met that guy over there, you know, out of the blue. Some, sometimes it just happens. Um, and again, people just accepting you and you being honest about your condition is is really kind of everything. It's, it's, it's the same kind of candidacy you would use for your doctors or anybody else. Hey, this is what's going on. Take it or leave it. Don't feel ashamed about who you are because this is not who you are, but this is a part of you. And I think it's important for people to understand that. And I think that goes back to the company you keep. And it's just one facet of who we are too. It's just one facet. It's one tiny little facet. We are so much more than our disease. That's just one thing. And you disclose what you want at your own discretion. I think you have to keep your sense of humor. (laughs) (laughs) Bill and I seem to have kind of a warped sense of humor, but... Um, <laughs> you know, one thing in particular was, you know, I, I never could see good at night, but now it's really challenging. So, you know, we used to have a basset hound that would, you know, fuss when I got up at night. And Bill would always say, here comes Helen Keller, watch out. <laughs> so, so um, you know, just don't always have it so heavy, but um, just in marriage, you know, you're going to have good com- communication and enjoy the ride. And I think for me, I'm single and have dated throughout having, when I've had an NMO. And um, yeah, I I agree with Elizabeth that, you know, it's one part of you and you choose when you tell that person Mm -hmm. um, what you have. But when I first started uh, or when I was first diagnosed and dating, I think I put too much emphasis on it. Thought, okay, this is, Mm -hmm. you know, going to make or break something. And then it it took me a while to figure out that that's just a very small piece of who I am, that, that I had to remember that. And, and like she said, too, it does weed out some people. Um, so, but it's, it's not easy, but dating's not easy anyway. So <laughs> Fall in love with yourself first. I think yeah. that's the most yeah. important yes. thing. Yes. Can't love somebody else if you don't love this person right here. In partnership, too. I've been married for almost 20, or just after 25 years. Um, and so... Chris, when I was first diagnosed, he did research so that I didn't have to, because Dr. Greenberg told me, you have NMO, don't go look it up. And so Chris did. And then he was able to kind of ease me into the information. That's the give and take that's in a relationship. That's the, you have to kind of both take and give um, no matter what you're facing. Absolutely. Any other questions? I I have a question slash comment. So, you know, each of you are women up there, and this is a natural character trait of women, is, you know, if we're going through something, we like to just handle it, usually. And I think, you know, Avery, there was, like, this question about dating advice. And I think I can speak to this myself. I don't don't live with NMOSD nor MOGAD, but I have other things that I'm navigating with. And part of you being part of a community is also being able to communicate what your needs are so that when you are in that partnership with someone, they also can uh, you know, help you. You have to help them help you, mm-hmm. essentially. So I think um, women do this, but just people in general. I think being able to communicate what you need more effectively is such an important thing. And I think it's something that patient advocacy organizations do a good job of helping people do that. But I think there needs to be a stronger push for that. Um, yeah, we have, uh, yeah, um, I'm going to, sorry if you don't mind, I'm coming with to you next. Uh, we have a question from um, our attendees online, and I know you guys kind of alluded to a little bit when you answered the question about what would you tell your younger self, which your answers were really special and I think resonated with everybody in the room. Um, but the question is, what would you tell your fellow um, members of the community, a fellow person with NMOSD or MOGAD. Maybe each person can can address that with something. I think connect with each other. I was genuinely surprised at how many true connections I made within the community. Is it on? Okay. Yeah. I was I was surprised at how many connections that I made within in the community, and I, it's it's scary at first to reach out to other people going through it, but that's the thing is other people are going through it too, so they're going to understand you. I haven't come across a lot of people that are, are like, no, don't don't talk to me. I don't want to talk to you about it. So 
is reach out because there's going to be somebody that's willing to listen. I think one of the things I would add to that is what you put into the community is what you're going to get out of it. It's a reciprocal relationship. If you can really give to the community, you will be shocked at what you get in return. Um, but that's, you know, that's the sh just the truth of it. Um, you'll find it extremely rewarding, but you do have to put yourself out there, and that and that takes that takes some guts. It's not easy to you know reach out and be like, hey, by the way, it's you feel like you're ad almost admitting a fault or something and you're like wait I'm talking to the exact same person that has the exact same thing why am I worried about this you know but I think that's something else you need to remember is like what you put into the community is also what you're going to get out of it right. we had a question right here Cool. Hello. <laughs> um, I was wondering about the difficulties of getting on disability because my wife is going through that right now and um, it's it's been quite a ride and I know some people go through it for years um, and sometimes you do it right away but um, it's it's just been really complicated with advocates and stuff um, but what are some of y'all's difficulties or tips or anything about getting on disability. Yeah, do we have anyone that has some experience with, with going through that process? Um, I would say as much as it sucks and as much as it's gonna cost you, get a lawyer. Um, yep. We did it multiple times without one and it was the same decision all five times. They were like, absolutely not. So I think having a lawyer is, is really a helpful tip and I think in the long run, it's gonna be worth it. It's always a, a very <laughs> tricky question, uh, a very difficult process. So, And there's lots of people in the community that are on it. Every story and circumstance is different, of course, but just asking questions that you think you need answers to, to other people that are going through would, it would also be helpful. All right, wow. I don't know, can we give a standing ovation for these ladies? This is incredible. You guys, um, <laughs> amazing. Wow. That was a very, very powerful session. Thank you all for your vulnerability, for your courage, and for your honesty. I am so moved by all of your strength, and um, I think it takes a lot of guts to come up here and say and share some of the things that you did for the sake of as someone said earlier, you're paying it forward. So thank you so, so, so much. And I wish you all the best of luck and good health and love and happiness and, and so much joy. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Let me take a picture. I listened to their, uh, I, I took their uh, advice to heart and I changed my shoes and listened to my body. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thank you, ladies. Good job, good job. Good job. Okay.